I'm going to... Uh, my zipper's all fucked up. Oh, my homeless pants. Kira, man, it's fucking cold. I haven't changed my clothes since December 12th. My hair's kind of a mess today, but that's okay. My hair's going to be doing weird things throughout this whole thing. Every time, every shot's going to be different. <laughs> This is a recording studio at 17 Frost Street. It's also attached to this art gallery. And this is the graffiti bathroom. Mae West said, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. We're just philosophers here. There's philosophy everywhere. The ladder's graffiti. The refrigerator's graffiti. Everything. So that is attached to this. This is a theater. So when I record bands, that we record out here. Really nice high ceilings, pretty dead sound, it's good. This box here is an EMT reverb plate. It's a giant thing, it's great. It's a sheet of steel on the inside, the sound goes through it, through it and it makes it sound like it has echo. I collect amplifiers too. Most of them I get broken and I fix. And this is the control room. 1985 MCI 3036 mixing board, 36 channels. I have always written songs since the time I picked up an instrument. I mean, because the idea was to express myself, and especially the guitar, because I'd come from a classical background where I was taught um, bassoon and saxophone, and the future of that meant playing somebody else's music for the rest of your life. And I thought, well, no, I want to be able to pick up an instrument and play when I'm feeling my own music. <laughs> This is a, what you might call a Frankenstein guitar. I got it from my friend, Danny Hirsch. He was a bass player in the outsets. This guitar was in two pieces in his house. This is a 1962 body, it's a 1973 neck. I put it together, and then I realized that it was warbling. It's like, so then I took some epoxy and glued the whole thing together. A good electric guitar, you can hear without the, electric, the guitar being plugged in. If you play it and you feel this vibration and you feel the woods working with everything, it resonates. It just, a note lasts. See how nice the guitar sounds? It's like a pet dog that can be really vicious, you know? The dog's really friendly to you, and you're a dog along, smiling, you play catch. But, if, you know, if, the, if someone bothers you or, you know, the dog, you know, wants to get mean, it can get really mean, you know? Well, when I first met Ivan, uh, I said, who is this guy? You know, you know, who's this guy? He's, who's the new guy on the block? kind of thing. You, you always feel that way, you know, Who's, uh, who thinks they're going to take a piece of your turf. Ivan was the only African-American person in the punk rock scene. And there haven't been a lot of black folks in the, in the East Village scene since, really. I think that Ivan has always been his own man, to follow his own love, his own desire. He's got that kind of spirit. He's his own man. I'm making two albums. One's gonna be what I call an acoustic album. It's gonna be kind of acoustic, but like not soft, like la la la, just, you know, different kinds of strings. And the other one's gonna be like a funkish kind of album. I'm working on it right now, here at the studio.
My great-grandfather was a carpenter. He built like all these houses in this town of Virginia. Like, he would drive to the town and he built every single house. Pretty amazing. I'm not a carpenter. I like doing it, but you know, it's wood's fascinating actually. It's basically just this stuff and you make it into blocks and then you make it into other things and it's beautiful. I was born on June 26, 1955, in Washington, D.C. My father was in the Navy. My parents having a, a complicated relationship. They didn't seem to like each other very much. My next real memory is we moved to Cuba. We moved to Guantanamo Bay. It's, it's a pivotal moment in my life because it's kind of what shaped a lot of the ideals that I have even today about things, people, places. Into the American naval base of Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia comes the Merchant transport, the Upshur, carrying 1,700 dependents of U.S. servicemen who were only a few days ago at Guantanamo, the mighty U.S. base in Cuba. I was raised in a, a Navy military family. I was expected to follow that path. I was expected to exceed that path. And there's nothing else I have a, a passion for, and that's something that was really important to me as a kid. When I made this decision was I wanted to be what I did. It was important for me to be the, the, the thing that, I mean, and have a passion for it. I've drilled holes in this thing. I've um, glued it, I've clamped it, and it turns out what was buzz is these little pins here that have crud in them and it makes it buzz. It's good. This piano is 105 years old. I'm going to make it sound like it was born yesterday. Now it's, everything's settled and it's, it's not buzzing anymore. It's all glued. I'm going to tune it up again. And I can finally record two or three songs with it for this record. So that's my goal. I think Ivan brings a lot of the spirit of early rock and roll, early Chuck Berry, even in his rhythm playing. You know, that's, it's in there because he understands it. I love soul music for one thing, and I could tell he was bringing rhythms that were more deeply rooted in R&B and, and the heart of rock and roll. A lot of what a guitar player must do is not with the dexterity, even though he is dexterous. It's what's happening in the mind, because you have to have a history of rock and roll. And Ivan can play the entire history of rock and roll in one solo. most notable about his playing is that as well as he played in 1976 when we formed, he's gotten better every decade. You know, there are a lot of people now who've come after him and I hear those little sensibilities in, in music. We put an ad in a magazine called Musicians Classified. There was just like a kind of giveaway magazine as far as I remember. So that's one of the places we advertised when we were looking for a second guitarist for the Voidors. We had me, Robert Coyne, Mark Bell. I started reading the paper and on this front cover it's this guy named Richard Hell. Whatever downtown um, poet, uh, you know, whatever artist, um, is, is starting his new band. He's left the Heartbreakers, he's not with them anymore. I go to this rehearsal studio called Daily Planet and there's this guy sitting there with the bass with like red glasses on. There's this guy behind the drums with long hair and there's this other guy but looked like some kind of college professor guy with glasses. And 
the college professor guy was kind of running the, the rehearsal, and they would show me some of the things that they were doing, like so, you, and you know, so like, okay, yeah, we have this song, and they would start to play it, and then we have this song, and they start to play it. They had like three songs or something like that. That was my first audition in the city. I'm there and I'm playing, and at the end, the rehearsal said, "We want you in the band." Quine was kind of designated to find the guitar player, the kind of band they wanted, it fashioned after the Yardbirds. Clapton and Beck, he had two guitar players. Both would play solos. It wasn't like one lead guitar player and one rhythm guitar player. Voidoids were definitely one of the prototype for the music that was coming out at that time. The way they kind of blended and interchanged with each other. The beauty of, of that original band, Richard Hell and the Voidoids, is they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. And they just kept trying to sound great through a really weird, spectrum of ideas. Voidoids were absolute opposite of like, you know, sticks and Journey and all that corporate rock in the, in the, in the, uh, in the early 70s. Dictators, the Heartbreakers, the Ramones, we were kind of like, fuck art, let's rock. And they were like, hey, I like art and let's rock. I liked their stuff. I, I, I liked what they were doing. I thought Blank Generation was called Black Generation. The music was very different. Richard Hell wrote a lot of the songs with, with Ivan and Bob and a lot of them were bass driven. They were hard to play. The Voidoids to me were beat poetry. They wanted to me more of that kind of no wave stuff. Every once in a while in America, the rest of the country looks to New York for what style is. That's kind of what the Voidoids were. But again, they were such a quick flash. The music industry really couldn't figure out what to do with it. Maybe today punk rockers can play that shit, but back in the day, punk rockers could play like three chords and just jam it out, you know. This stuff had way, way too many very, very sophisticated inclinations. Richard had this song, and we just started it, um, one, two, three. That's, that's what was there, so Richard says we need an intro. I don't know, I just played it. came out of me. I mean, I've never sat and go, well, like, why? D minor, there's no D minor. This. I'm sorry, I love it. You know, that, 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 when you hit that chord, it just says, fuck everything. This is 1976 in the spring, and it's decided that we record the record at Electric Lady Studios. That was exciting. This is Jimi Hendrix's studio. I couldn't believe it. I mean, of all the studios in New York that we get to get to record there, we recorded there for a month. Then Richard decided that he hated it. It's announced that we're going to make the entire record again. It, it was great being Electric Lady and all that, but it wasn't our best performance in terms of our record. We used these giant amplifiers, you know, because they were there and everything was just kind of big and clunky sounding. I didn't think it, it would justify making the record again, but I was young and didn't know you could do stuff like that. So we ended up going to Plaza Sound. They found something and they were doing something completely different. So, I mean, you can't even put them with the Ramones and a lot of the other stuff that sort of came up that was really, I guess, considered punk rock. I don't even know what punk rock is. The first time I heard <clears throat> the word punk was there was this magazine called Punk Magazine, started by John Holstrom and Legs McNeil. Just like as rock scene covered the Maxis thing and the glam thing, they covered basically CBGBs and the bands there. Punk Magazine pretty much nicknamed it punk rock. It was the only thing that separated it from just rock and roll. And that's the first time it was defined as punk rock. A genre, a category, that was the first time I heard it was from this magazine. I mean, and none of us thought, oh, we're making punk, or this is punk, or, you know, or, and, I, and to this day, I, I don't believe that, because to me, 
punk is, is an attitude to where, uh, to where you approach your life and you pro approach things, which basically means, you know, I try to be honest about the, the you know, whatever music I make. Um, I, I present it honestly and I take no shit. The word blank caught that moment in the late 70s perfectly. It was blank because people didn't think there was any future. People, you know what I mean? People were very iconoclastic, nihilistic generation, right? People thought that people thought it was like the end of the world, basically. Punk has a range of, uh, of uh, emotions. I mean, it's it's aggressive. It can be softer. It doesn't have to be hard. It can be romantic. People try to liken all punk to punk. It's just not the same. Those early years, when there was no word called punk, they were just making something new. I mean, that was very special. The attitude was: this is a, a, a blank slate and we're gonna put new rock and roll ideas on this blank slate. And if you dig it, you dig it. If you don't, who cares? We don't care. Contribution musically all came from my head. It didn't come from my playing. It didn't come from any kind of knowledgeability except for my ear. Ivan clicked from the beginning. My take on the band was Richard reminded me of a juvenile delinquent that would get you into trouble and get you arrested. Mark was just this kind of rocking drummer, had two girlfriends that um, would come to rehearsals and start fighting and pulling each other's hair out. Quine was a jazzbo who didn't really write, like rock and roll and just you know, had wanted nothing to do with it and you know was into his jazz. That, that was my first impression you know? and I was equally right and wrong about everything. It was random you know we just we, we fell together um, always with the success of bands or their lack of success most of it's luck. But those secret bands, those secret histories you know, that's what we musicians love. We go find the Robert Johnsons, we go find the Charlie Parkers, and we go find the Richard Hell and the Boyle. I gotta say something about Ivan. I tell you, you know, coming up, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of funny to be a, a rock and roll person of color, you know, black guy playing guitar, and we, you know, and and to see you as part of the Voidoids was I can't tell you how important that was, you know. But there was a handful of brothers like making it happen, and we, you know, coming up, it was so important to have people to look towards. You know, people that were in that were yeah. in it, and really making it happen. It had a lot of significance for people like us who were looking at punk rock as, you know, something that we could be part of. You know, but yet, in a way, it was like, it was like the fabric of America. So the punk scene was very, it was very much a white scene, and to have a brother in that scene with the, playing guitar and making it work was a huge thing because Prince doing Little Red Corvette was a big deal to hear that on the radio. But to see you hitting with Richard and Robert and that was, because that makes it, oh, that's in front of me. He was a symbol of a person that could do it, who wasn't just a white guy from the suburbs, but this kind of guy from an urban background and played in, in, in uh, you know, soul and R&B bands, and then suddenly comes to New York and creates this sound that's completely different. He broke the color line. He broke it. He came in, he was the guy. He came in and he said, look, I'm me. This is who I am. And you're gonna take it or leave it, but I'm gonna still be me. Let's talk about punctuation. Richard had this song, Love Comes in Spurts. Um... So I heard that and I thought, well, I mean, and that's what Quine played. And I thought, no, let's, you know, let's make some rhythm on it. And it's kind of, you know, 
um, take it somewhere. So I basically punctuated what was happening, which is if you hear one speaker, speaker this quine doing that, and the other speaker this me going. <laughs> He really liked ruffled shirts. He liked women's clothes. We used to shop near 14th Street at this place. He'd find a, a woman's raincoat, vinyl raincoat, black, fake. And then he'd get like three of them because he knew, like he loved the, the coat and he'd love it forever. I heard someone once say I would wear velvet every day if it were socially acceptable. And I wear it anyway. We were recording a song called Swing Your Lantern that was written by my friend Will. Um, who's also partners in the studio. I produced his band, I produced this record many years ago, and I decided that uh, on this record I'm going to re-record it and um, I'm going to cover it myself. I mean, yeah, I did just kind of make this band for this song. This is Batty and this is Haley. Are they assisting on the session? This is Trevor. Trevor. Tre Trevor's, Trevor's can't come for a long way, many miles, to come play, come play with us. This is Will. He's the writer of the song, the co-writer. This is Al Maddy, um, legendary guitar player. He's going to be playing um, electric acoustic with us tonight. And out of retirement is Mr. James Burton. Out of base retirement, but I've been listening to Ivan since I was a teenager, so can't say no to Ivan. I like the first one. First one? The first one is a song, yeah. The first one is like, you know what I mean? It's got song, song. There you go. There you go. When Mark was. Not that I'm a, you know, I mean, I mean, just musically, that chemistry, that thing that made, you know, a lot of people like the second album kind of, which I'm not even on. I'm not on Destiny Street, but it, it was over then. It was, it was on tenuous ground ever since that, that happened because, you know, that core thing that made the music just wasn't, the, the, all the elements weren't there. But I mean, on, on top of that, Richard really didn't want to tour that much. You know, and I came to New York into the Vortex as a touring musician, and I wanted and making and I wanted to make records, and I wanted to continue to do that. So I was the first one to leave. I called Richard and said, you know, it's done. It was just because, basically because there's too much downtime, you know, in my mind. All the other bands from my era, like you know, Blondie, Talking Heads, Ramones, Patty, da da da, they were all 
working all the time and playing all the time and touring all the time. And we were lucky to, you know, to do something once a month. Richard had this idea that he only wanted to play punk venues. That was his thing. We're only playing punk venues. Problem was, there were no punk venues. <laughs> That's when I started the outset. I'm going to do my own. Uh, the outset started in uh, 1981. And this was after a few attempts uh, by uh, Richard Hell to get the Vordoids back, do some playing. I mean, because, you know, initially I came to New York to do my own band anyway. But then when I, I thought, well, I need to play. And then when I ran into the Vordoids, like, basically in my first month here, yeah, I mean, after that, I thought, yeah, I'm going to start my own band. And we started playing what uh, we interpreted it as punk funk rooted. We started recording, put out a few EPs, Garland Jeffries recorded uh, one EP. I really didn't know what to do first. And then I clicked in. The best thing I can do is let this band be what it is. By 8081, the scene had changed a lot. I pretty much thought punk rock was pretty much done by that time. I thought he had more fun with the lyrics, funky beat and Siamese. <laughs> In my opinion, Ivan's one of the three best guitar players in New York. Now, some people may disagree, but he's definitely in the top five. What you had in New York at that time is you had Richard Lloyd, Tom Verlaine, Ivan Julian, Bob Quine. Those were your guitar combos that were unbeatable and unique. Ivan could make the most in tune guitar sound out of tune and in a very charming way. Not being perfect gives personality. I mean, when you're stretching for a note, you communicate the lyrics better than if you hit the note right on. Even when I would play with Ivan, I'd go, I'd always go, oh, how do I doctor that? Because he's got so much dissonance in, in those uh, notes. You can hear that it's that he's making it a weapon. And sometimes if, if uh, as guitarist, when I would play with him, you know, he would even look at me and goes, that's, that's too obvious, that's too sane, that's too, it should be more like blah. You go, oh wow, how do I get blah? And that's what he was going for. Ivan was always bartering with the devil on those notes. Recording Perfect. the tape is a much more direct process. Mm. It, it's, it, it's like you kind of plug a couple of things in and you push record and you go. There's not many options to like recording in, in, on, on to analog tape. And it's like, it's kind of simpler because your, your mind isn't clouded with all, this other, all these other options and things that might not be set right or could go this way or that way. It's just boom, record. It, it's like, it kind of puts a smile on your face. These two are LA-2A compressors. I built these. People told me they wanted them. I've actually built probably close to 15 of them. What drove me, it was really strange, is I wanted to see the needle go backwards. Because when these are working, these needles don't move forwards like most needles. They go backwards. And I was obsessed with that. And also, and how they sound. Aretha, she used these for Aretha Franklin's voice a lot.
These are all two preamps. The four at the bottom are Ampex preamps. They use these at, at Sun Studios when they recorded Elvis. One of them we got from Capitol Records out in LA. And there's a picture of Frank Sinatra with one of these. These are tubes. They don't use them anymore because they use a lot of voltage. It's a much softer sound, a much warmer sound. Nothing sounds like tubes, nothing. It is one of the last analog studios in New York, and especially with the space. You know, with the amount of space we have, it's pretty phenomenal to have like this much room in New York City for anything, even a supermarket, you know? It just he, it just takes off. It transcends. Let's talk about the foundations for a second. I mean, it's like. Those guys, they have amazing songwriters, amazing performers, taught me pretty much everything I know about being a professional musician and being on the road and working really hard. I mean, <clears throat> they would play two cities in the same day, have the equipment set up for them in the second city while they played the first, and we would all jump in the car and run and, you know, drive, I don't know, 100 kilometers, 60 miles or so. But their chords, I've used their chords a lot. guitar players, like someone like an Eric Clapton is considered a great virtuoso, he understands the blues and he uses that when he plays. And Ivan has that understanding for rock and roll. So that's why people want to work with him. That's why I wanted to work with him before I even met him. He understands music from the inside out. So we would just talk for hours about the roots of what we're doing now, you know, understanding it. I think that's an important thing with, with an artist, is to understand the history of what you're doing. The best musicians, in my mind, know when not to play as opposed to when to play. That was a strict lesson that I learned from the foundation because it was pop music. This wasn't like rock and roll or, or rock music, I should say, with lots of long guitar solos and you're able to riff out the, the whole time. You know, it's just like short solo, eight bars, maybe four, shut up, play the chords, you know, push the song. I, I like to write and re record and play music. So to me, if, if I'm producing a, an album, 
or if I'm playing guitar in somebody's band, or if I have a, my own band, I'm playing music. You know, I, I really don't care. It's like I, if I'm playing music, I, I feel like I'm doing what I should be doing. The story with me in the class goes back to the beginning, actually. I play with the Foundations, and then I go back to New York and I meet Richard and I join the Voidoids. And our first tour is a tour of England opening for The Clash. We start doing the tour, we start hanging out, we become friends, and Mick invites me over his house. Another year or so passes, they come to New York to record Sandinista and basically just set themselves up inside of Electric Lady Studios. And they called me and said, well, you know, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. And they said, come on down. So I went there to just kind of to say hello. And then they started playing on this riff. I thought, wow. So I, I said, you know, give me a guitar. So they gave me Joe's guitar. So I started playing along with them. And we started jamming on this thing called The Call Up. That rhythm seemed right for what they were doing, you know. It's just, I mean, I wasn't trying to play reggae or ska because, you know, just like it was just a rhythm part, and like and it had a nice chord progression. I thought that was that, and we did an, we did another song. I mean, then I told them the story about me going to Studio 54 and getting in a you know altercation with this bouncer when him and I were the only ones in the whole place because it was after uh, Studio 54 was all that, and he was like kind of following me around to see what I, what, I, what I was doing, and that pissed me off. So I told him that story. And we started playing on another thing, and that became Ivan Meets G.I. Joe. So, but I thought these were just jams. There's no, no, it's not like, oh, I'm playing on your record, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing formal or anything like that. Then, um, I guess like another six months or so passes, and Mick calls me and says, hey, you should contact Columbia Records. They have a check for you. I said, for what? He goes, for playing on the single from the Sandinista. So that's how that whole thing came about. It just kind of just happened, you know? In the 80s, I, I, I rented myself out. I was playing with a band called Shriek Back, that was doing really well. I played with Sandra Bernhardt for a couple of years. And in the 90s, when my son was born, um, I needed more money, so I went out and, and I rented myself out to Matthew Sweet. And that lasted like six years, you know? Robert Quine had played on Matthew's girlfriend record, so he recommended me to be the touring guitar player. So then I started touring with Matthew, and that lasted until like 97, playing on his records, touring with him, you know, all over the world. One of the first really guitar overdoses I ever had in my life, in a good way, was seeing Ivan Julian as the guitar player for Matthew Sweet. And the guitar playing, you didn't watch Matthew the whole show or even listen to the songs hardly. It was just about Ivan Julian from the start of the show to the finish, and I'll never forget it. And I wrote the Naked Flame in, in the 90s, actually. I mean, the song. But yeah, it didn't occur to me to, to run out and you know tour with it. It's like I was you know playing with Matthew at the time. <laughs> to try to deceive you I can't get these asses just to be by your side Come on and take my hand and try to rearrange Well, Naked Flame, I had no idea he was making the record or had planned on, on uh, you know, touring behind the record or anything. I was taught in school that there's no sound in outer space because there's a vacuum. But they just found this a volcano or something on Jupiter, and they heard it. They heard this thing on Jupiter. So if they're hearing it on Jupiter, there must be sound in, in the vacuum. So that means when you play a note, boom, and it goes out, it keeps going out into outer space. So if you were in tune to 
a 440 hertz, that 440 cycles is, is universal. It's everywhere. So theoretically, when Chopin first sat down to write his sonatas and to a down on the piano, that note, that chord is out there somewhere. That's what we should be chasing. When I hear sound, I see it as like maybe um, a box that has not only a front, but it has sides and it has a top, and it has a bottom, and it has a back. If you think of any great song you've ever heard, the sound of the song complements the song as well. You know what I mean? It's like not just the person playing or the person singing, the actual sound of the recording is almost always, that's not just the gear, but it's the room. You know, the room and the invisible person in the band. Today is January 23rd, 2016. Last fall, around October, I was diagnosed with cancer. I have cancer. Then I've been to chemo and radiation five days a week, every week, in an effort to cure this. It's been the most painful experience of my life. We're now going to an MRI um, center. And what's going to happen with that is um, <clears throat> um, they're going to scan me. I have to get these scans every three or four months or so. A speedy recovery, but it, it wasn't. But the very fact that I recovered at all, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing to them and me. So they just want to check on it to make, to make sure. As people come up to me and they go, oh, you beat it. I didn't beat anything. It let go of me, you know.
just think of um, all the things you've done just in the past year and you reflect on those like or maybe you know you like reflect on years later and it's this amazing journey where one one day you're here one day you're in this country one day you're doing this one day you're working with this person it's, it's just a journey you know and you, you want the journey to continue because you realize what an amazing journey it is please ring the bell So we're going to go downstairs. Your brain's out. <laughs> yeah. I have a point for 215. My last name's Julian. What happened there is like they didn't have me scheduled at the radiation center for this um, scan thing. This is typical of the kind of thing that goes on inside the hospital system. The way it was explained to me, is that um, my my immune system is weak, you know, from the radiation and from the chemo, and um, the cold exacerbates it and makes it worse. A shrink once told me, "Listen to your inner voice." My inner voice tells me, "You don't, your body doesn't need radiation right now." I was very lucky to have good doctors that not only address the chemo and the radiation part of it, but also the psychological part of it. That's what was going through my head. It's like, okay, I have good care around me. I'm, I'm, I'm being told to get rid of, you know, to, to alleviate stress, not deal with stressful things. I'm still recovering and I still have to pace myself. And my doctor, Dr. Cassetta, goes, well, we might start using the R word. And I said, what is the R word? She goes, remission. I thought, okay. And they're very cautious because I don't want to say it's gone. It's going to say remission, which means it's going away.